All right, hello everyone, and welcome to Musically Speaking. I am Rod DeGeorge, and we're joined today by the incredibly talented Tom Quayle. Tom, hey, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you, Rod? Doing good. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure for sure, man. The pleasure's all mine. Really nice to see you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let's jump right in, and uh, let's start from the beginning, actually. Uh, can you tell us what inspired you to get into music, and uh, was it the guitar that got you into music, or did music lead you to the guitar? Funnily enough, um, like everyone describes my family as the Von Trapps family. Everybody <laughs> plays an instrument. Oh, you all guitar, actually. Uh, my mum sings, my sister sings, my oldest brother sings. They they used to, my oldest brother does gigs. Um, my parents used to run folk clubs, um, like kind of bluegrass, um, traditional kind of British folk, traditional American folk. Um, so I was exposed to music from a, from basically from birth. And okay. my dad is a phenomenal guitar player. Like it's not an exaggeration to say he's a phenomenal guitar player. He really is. He's one of those annoying people. If he watches this, he'll know, like he'll be cool with this because I always say this about him. But he's <laughs> one of those annoying people who can do everything really, really well. Oh, like wow. he renovates houses, builds classic cars from scratch. He's yeah. just an amazing guitar player. You know, just he, he's basically a Tommy Emmanuel, Doyle Dykes kind of finger style guy. Oh, great. And yeah. Just transcribes it all by ear and then just figures it out, basically. And so I heard him play from an early age um, and didn't really. I mean, you don't want to do what your parents do. So right. I didn't get into it for a long time. And then when I was 15, maybe 14, 15, I can't remember the exact age, but um, my dad came home with a, a guitar and a guitar techniques magazine. Um, and I'd shown an interesting guitar, but never done anything with it. I didn't, I didn't have practice or have lessons or anything. And one day it turned up, I don't know if you know Guitar Techniques magazine. Yes, if you're, yes. If you're aware. So yeah. it's, it's pretty famous across the world. And um, he brought this magazine home. And I suddenly found myself getting ridiculously into guitar at the sort of, you know, mid-teenage years, so 15 yeah. or so. And obviously having had guitar in my life from day one and very high level guitar as well, um, I guess it just was something that I took to, I, I don't want to say naturally, because that sounds like, you know, it's like um, blowing your own trumpet, as we say in the UK. It's like, right. you know, I'm, I don't mean it like that, but it just was something that, that seemed natural to do. Let's put it that way. And um, yeah, from that point onwards, I just became addicted completely. So for me, definitely music came first right. and then the guitar as opposed to the other way around. Um, and yeah, my dad really was the main driver of that. And um, yeah, I've got him to thank. Um, and uh, yeah, he's he's the guy that kind of got me into it. So that's how it worked, really. And then since then, my parents still gig. They run a folk club now. Oh, great. Um, and as I say, my sister writes. Uh, she's a singer-songwriter. My brother's a singer-songwriter. So it's really just a thing that's in my family gotcha. constantly. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, with you saying your dad is a phenomenal player, uh, the bar was set pretty high from a very young age, you know. So With most things, yeah, absolutely. yeah. Like <laughs> it was funny. I come uh, from where I grew up. Uh, I would go to a club one week and I'd see Richie Kotzen play. Then the next right. week I would see Greg Howe play, and uh, and there was a lot of other musicians who are of world class at a world class level who didn't really break through. But mm. uh, on the East Coast, not too far from. New York City, uh, about two hours, you know, it's a very densely populated area. So yeah, yeah. in your head, that's what you were like, okay, that's what I have to work towards. It, so right away, you're working towards uh, world class level. And you had that in your own household. So uh, well, this is the thing, you know, and also because of so I had that with my dad, and he was a phenomenal guitar player generally. And then the Guitar Techniques magazine thing, you know, the scene you're talking about that yeah. you, you sort of experienced yourself, that was the dream because we were experiencing this through the magazine. And the it's a little bit like like guys these days, we might get onto this, I'm not sure, but um, the YouTube generation have got all this incredible content that, that they yeah. can see all the time. And the level just gets higher and higher. Like Guitar Techniques magazine was just, I just consumed everything that was in there. So yeah. whilst I couldn't go and see... Greg Howe, you know, um, Steve Vai, Joe Satriani, all my, we'll, we'll talk about that, I guess, later, but all my early yeah. heroes, you know, you could hear them in the magazine and it was like the second best thing to that. So, you know, it was just total and utter kind of overload yeah. of music and I loved it. It was just, it's some, some of the fondest, when I look back on it, some of the fondest years of my life where I was just, I didn't have anything else to do. I could just literally, no responsibilities, just play guitar all day. Yeah. And I think, I remember at one point my my mum saying, right, 
we, we the, the exams that we do in the UK for your mm -hmm. secondary school, we do these what, what's called GCSEs. Yeah. And they're like the first really important exams you do. And I remember my parents saying, right, we're going to have to take the guitar off you because you're going to fail these exams. And I remember really just like, I didn't care. I just wanted to yeah. play guitar. That was what I wanted to do. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's just an addiction. And it still is to, to almost the same extent. You know, you yeah. know what it's like. I don't need to tell you. Yeah, you yeah. Like. And the thing that you were saying about reading about it in the magazine, that's, that's one thing. Uh, but for some people, that seems like, an unobtainable go goal, but uh, like I said, Richie Casson and Greg Howe grew up not from far from where I lived, so I saw them in clubs before they broke. So to me, that was the local scene, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. and like you, you just had to look at your dad, and that was yeah. right there. So right away, yeah. that that's yeah. interesting um, because I think it uh, it uh, changes your mindset about goals that you're shooting for, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it normalizes to some extent, like the level that could seem unachievable. If you see it every exactly. day, it normalizes it slightly, yeah. like not, not in the way that it becomes easier as such, but the level of work that's required because you see it every day. You're not quite so overwhelmed, but I don't I don't think exactly. and you set your yeah. goalposts slightly differently to how you would if you were slightly less or more intimidated by it. So it is interesting. I never thought of it, actually. But yeah, I think I have a huge amount. Of, of you know i owe my dad a great deal and i'm the first to say it he's, he's the guy that really did uh you know inspire me in a big way and that's great to have that in your house directly exactly. you, know, you can't beat that really that's incredible yeah that's awesome man mm. yeah now you're known more for your fusion influence playing but uh what was it in the beginning that uh you used to listen to and um you used to try to play sit in front of a the stereo or whatever and work it out yeah, so my the, the first bands I was into when I got into guitar were just power chord bands like like modern or what was modern then. You know, yeah. this is like nineteen ninety five. So uh, bands I, I don't even know if you, you like they're British kind of punk bands. So the Wild Hearts was big for me. Okay. My brother was into bands like Therapy um, and Nine Inch Nails and stuff oh, yeah. like that. So that was what I heard initially, and then very very quickly got into Iron Maiden, Metallica, the obvious kind of. Um, kind of rock and metal route yeah, where yeah. you could go from power chords, just basic power chords like Nirvana and stuff like that, where you could get a riff down pretty quickly yeah. to slightly more complex stuff and where the lead stuff's coming in. So you've got, you know, I learned every single Kirk Hammett solo. Yeah. I learned all of, all of the Iron Maiden stuff. And I remember my parents had a, um, like a farm. Uh, we didn't live on a farm, but it was like what you call a small holding farm. So we had some okay. animals and stuff, but it wasn't a big deal. And they had this barn that was in, I think, in the process of being converted. And I had like a Marshall valve state, which to me was like the best thing ever. It was like a 40 watt combo, which was pretty loud, to be honest, for me yeah. at the time. And I used to stick it in this barn and turn it all the way up and sit with it on my right hand side always. And it's, it's left me with a little bit of hearing damage, actually. Oh, wow. It was so loud. <laughs> and I used to sit. And in those days, what would happen is I would get the album and whatever album it was. So it very quickly kind of progressed onto Steve Vai, Jess Atriani, Dream Theater were the yeah. biggest guy and the biggest influence at that time. And I would get the, the album and then the book, the tab book. Right. And I would just digest every single note in every single tab book. And I would put the, the CD player on as loud as it would go. And it was never loud enough. It couldn't compete <laughs> with the valve state. And I would try and play along with this stuff. And I remember how funny it was because when I discovered Dream Theater, I had a friend of mine who played guitar as well. And, um, we used to hang out a lot and kind of play, but never very good, really. And then he gave me images and words. And I used to play it to every single person who came to the house. I used to put um, Under a Glass Moon on. Yeah. And I have no idea why I used to do it. But I would, you know, like, say, for instance, my brother's violin teacher would come around or one of my mum's friends or something. I'd be like, you've got to hear this. This is going to change your life like it's changed mine. I was yeah, convinced. Yeah. That this was the greatest thing they would ever hear, and they would all become converts to Dream Theater. I don't know what I was thinking, yeah. but I used to play this, stuff. and that basically was was my whole life. Um, I was into the shred thing, um, yeah. and got really into progressive rock and metal and stuff. And you know, uh, it was just a total obsession for me. So I learned every single Steve Vai album. I say note for note. I don't mean it quite like that because I couldn't play all of it, but I could play a decent chunk of it. You know, I used yeah. to practice a lot, and that was my practice. I just used to sit and play through the albums. You know, put one on, play through it, put the next one, play through yeah. it. So uh, I was just spared the thing of having to work it out yourself because all the tab books were out. So I guess in a way, maybe I missed out on something there. I probably did, but it was a very useful way of learning because that and Guitar Techniques magazine, I guess my generation, you know, 
that was the way a lot of us learned. We had right. the tablature books and we learned note for note what everybody was playing. There was kind of not so much mystery involved with it, but yeah. you know, it was accurate and so you developed a lot of technique very quickly. Yeah. So yeah, uh, straight ahead shred and metal guy. Yeah, and it, it's a great way to, to practice too because uh, yeah. when you're getting stuff down and you're playing by yourself, you may hesitate from one a transition to the next. You're playing with yes. the recording. They're not going to wait for you. You have to, nope. you have to keep go. up with You've it. Yeah. I used to spend tons of time uh, put on my Zeppelin, Hendrix, Aerosmith, all that kind of stuff. And that was my practice routine in, yeah. uh, as a kid, you know. So, yeah, I know where you're coming from. That's very cool. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Now, um, now you have such a fluid a fluid sound and obviously it has to do with a uh, legato technique, but your legato is quite different than a lot of rock players. And even like, um, the stuff you were listening to the more metal stuff, you have a totally different sound there and, uh, it has to do with the grouping of notes, the evenness. And even when you do hybrid picking, it's not that snap of like chicken picking. So can yeah. you discuss a little bit, uh, how that came to be and how you achieve that sound? Yeah, I, I often think with techniques um, that people become quite well known for. So if you think of guys like Andy Wood, for instance, is known for his picking. Yeah. Um, Brett Garsett, known for his legato. I mean, all the legato guys I listen to. Often, <laughs> the technique that you become known for is, it, it, like for me, this is my experience of it, it was either something that came very naturally to you, so you didn't have to struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle with it. So you found right. that you could develop it more because it was more natural for you. Mm -hmm. Or it was kind of a... A byproduct of not being able to do something else so for instance i'm a t i'm not a terrible picker i can pick but i can't improvise picking i have like if i play a predetermined phrase i have right. a lot of speed if you like but if i have to improvise and i have to be free with the technique and be kind of flexible and be able to manipulate the technique i struggle with picking for some reason i don't struggle with legato and i think i know why that is um when I started to get big into the legato thing. Like if you'd heard me play, and I won't play you any of this stuff because it's quite embarrassing, but if you'd heard me play, say, 2000, the year 2000 or 2001, um, I was big into the jazz thing. I was basically a massive Pat Metheny guy. I was into Kurt Rosenwinkel, all these big jazz guys. And I really wanted to do that. That was my dream at that point. And I graduated from my jazz degree in about 2002, I think it was. And I sounded nothing like I do now. I didn't play legato. I didn't play fusion at all. I was just a straight ahead kind of slightly more modern jazz guy. And all of that was kind of picked um, a la, sort of picked with a little bit of legato, a la Pat Metheny or yeah. you know, any of those guys. Not the George Benson thing, but more kind of the kind of legato-y picked version. So a hybrid of those two things. Right. Um, and then a, a student of mine, who lived in Paris, um, came over to the UK and uh, brought me Extraction by Greg Howe. Oh, yeah, yeah. And obviously I'd heard Greg Howe loads. I mean, he was a big hero of mine already, but um, I'd not listened to him for a long time because I'd gone, say, like 1999 when I started my jazz degree, I was just listening to jazz for three or four years and was totally immersed myself in it. And he brought Extraction around. And, of course, Extraction has all of that jazz harmony. Yeah. The time feel, it's got, you know some standards on, like protocosmos for instance you yeah. know that's like a, a fusion standard yeah. and suddenly i thought man that sound like something a little bit like with images and words yeah like that that sound just brought something back out of me and so i started working on my legato technique again um and because of the, my knowledge that i developed of how to practice at that point you know at this point i've been playing probably for about 10 years and had way more, I'd done the jazz degree and had way more experience of how to practice technique properly. Right. I actually sat and practiced the legato. We, we can probably talk a little bit about how I practiced it, but I would do yeah, it really, great. really, really slowly and very, very much made it identical to how it would be if I was playing faster. So I'm not, unfortunately, because I'm using your ears, you're not going to be able to hear the guitar, but I can play right. without it being plugged in. But like the real smooth kind of, All that yeah. stuff came about from, I would say, probably three or four years of really slow, and I apologize, it's super quiet. That, oh, I can hear it, that's good. But, but just really slow practice where essentially the technique developed itself because I was playing so slowly. What I was trying to do actually was, was actually thread these lines through chord changes. So as opposed to just practicing like, oh, sorry. 
scale runs with picking, right. for instance, which is what I used to do when I was younger. I'd practice predetermined phrases. I was improvising lines with legato through chord changes. Gotcha. So I might do it over jazz standards. I might do it over things like, you know, more complex things like giant steps, all these really, really complex things with loads of chords in. And therefore, I was having to think about the lines that I was playing. And so the primary concern became slowing down enough that my brain was in control and not my fingers. And by virtue of doing that for probably three or four years, the technique kind of developed itself. Gotcha. So that the technique developed in an interesting way. You, you probably find, like a lot of, when I, when I teach, a lot of guys find that their technique level when they improvise is sort of, let's say you've got your technique level is here. That's maybe yeah. 90, I don't know, out of an arbitrary number, let's say 100 is like, pick your favorite guy who's got, like Andy Wood. Let's, yeah. let's just pick Andy Wood. We'll make him the arbitrary number. <laughs> and you find that your technique level is maybe here, like hypothetically, whoever you are. Right. Uh, but when you improvise, maybe it's down here somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you improvise, you've got a, you know, there's a lot more considerations going on. There's rhythmic considerations, note choice, there's any chord changes. Whereas when you're playing a predetermined thing, you don't have to think of any of those things. You just move your fingers in the way that you've trained them to move on that very specific pattern. Yeah. Um, but because I was practicing the technique improvisationally all the time, it developed into this thing where I've actually got control over the direction of the line gotcha. as opposed to having to play the same thing every time. So it's still kind of based around like, I wouldn't call them licks. I do play licks, obviously. I would never be one of those guys that says I don't play licks. But it's based around cells, like loads and loads of cells that you can manipulate. Yeah. And yeah. it just gives you loads of options. So, so the result of that was years of incredibly slow practice, which meant that the technique is very, very relaxed. And what that gave me was, because of my jazz sort of training, if you like, it's a horrible jazz training. It makes, <laughs> it, it, makes it sound like you've been through a production line. But the, because of the jazz thing. Yeah. I, I was already aware of, of very, very strongly aware of, of musical subdivisions. Yeah. And so what that develops was a sense of if you've got, if that's your pulse and you're going, yeah. dagger, 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 what you find with a lot of legato guys, like if you take Joe Satriani, for instance, and this yeah. is a good thing, by the way, yeah. none of this is like, this is better than that or whatever. But right. when he plays legato, it's like a liquidy, I think he describes it as mercury rolling around yeah. in the ball of his hand. That's cool. So like if you take... Yeah. It's very, very fast. And if you were to write it out musically, there'd be like a group of 11 here and then a group of eight. And then, you know, it's not, yeah. it doesn't divide into the bar equally. It floats on the time. Exactly. Whereas the way I play legato, it's like dagger, 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 dagger. So, or you could play triplets. So, again, sorry, it's really quiet. Oh, it's, no, um, that, that's all right. And you know, one you're the, hearing, the, sorry, go on. Oh, I was just going to say, one of the things I hear in your playing and also in Greg Howe's playing is it might have that 16th note uh, feel, but you may be doing groups of five. So the starting oh, yeah. point is starting at a different point uh, in the beat. And yep. the listener doesn't necessarily uh, hear that five note repeating pattern, even if you do it, because the yep. way the, the bars line up and it, it just has this cool uh, f floating feel, even though you're in a pretty strict time, but Absolutely. where you start, uh, that has a, a great feel. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I always felt like, um, and again, this was, because this legato thing came quite late in my technical development. You know, I've, I've been doing it now probably about 10 years. So it's a while now, but um, still, you know, it's, it's not like a new thing um, right. for me, but it's newer than my, my other technique, for instance. And therefore, um, let's say, for instance, if I was playing, uh, like a lot of rock guys, myself included, use three note per string scales. Yep. I never wanted to be restricted the, the note value that I play by the number of notes on the string. Yeah. So one thing a lot of guys find, and I talk about this in my tutorials as well, um, is that when you play three note per string, you automatically get this triplet feel. So you get... Yeah. Okay, so that is something you want to try and avoid because if you're playing 16th notes, if you're going yeah. dagger, 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 if you were to pick it, it's no problem because you can accent every four exactly. notes. Exactly, yeah. But with legato, you get this. And that's that's kind of where that five and four and you know different groupings come, come from because I worked really hard to practice making it super even. Yeah. So that when you play the scale, again, you probably won't be able to hear this very well, yeah. but. It's just like dagger, dagger, yeah. dagger, dagger, dagger. I'm kind of removing the accents yeah. as opposed to. 
So you get dagger, 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 dagger in your mind, but you're, you're not actually accenting anything, so you don't hear those string changes. Exactly. And so, therefore, you can group things in different ways without having to um, worry too much about you know how the grouping is actually functioning. I'm just wondering if my my pack seems to have died. Hold, hold on one second. Okay, no problem. Let me just plug the headphones in a slightly different way. I apologize. Give me one second. Technical difficulties. <laughs> Right, now I can hear you again. I All right, great. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no problem. Uh, so basically, you lighten up your picking and mm. make sure the hammers are the same volume so yes. everything's nice and fluid. And that's something that uh, the majority of people may not even think about. You know, they're trying to execute it, you know, <laughs> and they may not be as aware of, okay, I have to lighten this up to make the hammer on the same volume. And in doing yeah. so, you create that fluidity and yeah. uh, it's, it's a great, great sound. Like, um, do you listen, uh, I'm assuming you, you do, but uh, do you listen to Holdsworth a lot? Oh, yes. Yeah. And now when he does pull-offs, I think he actually is more like, hammering on as opposed to pulling so, pulling the so string. the legend goes so the legend goes and i i think the legend is correct that he, yeah. he does hammer backwards if you like and i don't know if you've ever tried it but it's an incredibly difficult thing to do to, it is because you have to get the previous finger out the way before you actually exactly. hammer on so in a in a way it seems like because you have to lift the other finger off and then slam well slam not slam but hammer on the other finger behind yeah. it you should get a less legato sound but for some reason I think because of the consistency of the attack, yeah. it sounds unbelievably smooth. And yeah. Obviously, he's the evidence for that. I actually did practice that for a long time, probably for about a year, yeah. and eventually gave up on it because, for me, my own technical inconsistencies with it were they outweighed the fact that I could actually achieve a pretty smooth sound with pull-offs. Exactly, um, yeah. I, I know that you'd mentioned um, before we sort of did this interview about that sometimes you get this kind of effect where yeah. if you pull off really hard, the string can go out of tune a little bit. Yeah. And obviously, that's undesirable in some scenarios and desirable as it can be a cool sound. Yeah. Um, but I always find um, if, if you're a legato guy, for me, and this kind of seems counterintuitive, the best guitars to play for legato are arch top guitars with really flat fretboards and really thick strings. Yeah. So when I was um, when I when I transitioned into this style, I was actually playing an Ibanez AS80, which is a, a, a like a three three five style guitar with flat wound, mm -hmm. thirteen gauge strings on. Wow. And man, that guitar was the ultimate legato guitar. Now, of course, the downside is that you can't do like I do a lot of kind of when I play more kind of rock in my fusion playing, I have quite an aggressive attack, yeah. lots of gain, mm -hmm. um, or relatively, relatively high amounts of gain. It's more of a kind of rock approach, you know, wider vibrato. And obviously that's out the window when you play with that right. kind of guitar. You need this kind of more super strat style guitar. Mm -hmm. And all, all my Fibonaris are kind of, apart from the hollow, uh, the semi-hollow one, they're all set up as kind of super strat-esque kind of guitars. And so there's a compromise, but man, if you want to try amazing legato guitars, set up, get a set of 13s on an arch top, and it's just the best feeling ever. Uh, and yeah. the physics kind of makes sense because when you have lighter gauge strings, like I use 10s, mm -hmm. when you do the pull-off, the string is obviously going to move yeah. a little bit out the way, especially if you pull off hard. I mean, my technique is really, really light um, because I have my guitar set up well. The action's not super low, but it, it's actually higher than people think, but it's not really high. Right. Um, so it's not difficult to play. But but equally the guitar is is it's got very flat fretboard, very big frets, so you can play with relative ease and very light kind of feel. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if the string is very tight and it's a 13 gauge set, obviously as you do the pull off, it just stays completely rigid. Yeah. And you just br you just brush off the string, and because you're moving quite a large mass, it vibrates for a long time as well. So you yeah. get a big consistency to the sound. So it's quite interesting because it's counterintuitive. People think, oh, stick eights on here. Yeah. And I'll just, oh, man, I'll suit, you know, super shred. And it's true. You can play really, really, really fast on a set of eights, but the accuracy is not quite as good. And I like kind of consistent feel. Yeah. So if I could string these up with like a set of 13s, I mean, the <laughs> neck would probably just junk, but yeah, so yeah. it's not going to work. But, you know, that's, that's kind of my favorite set. Well, really. the, the same thing goes for uh, picking, like with alternate mm -hmm. picking, the tighter the string, the thicker the string, the tighter the string, the less it gives. So yes. you feel like you have uh, great accuracy. I used to use 11s all the time. Um, mm. And then um, it would feel great with the picking. 
and then like doing tons of shows and doing lots of wild bends, you know, you start getting blood under the fingernails because of <laughs> pulling, <laughs> pulling the, and it's like, you know, that's I, rock and roll. Yeah. It's and it's like, and that's maybe I'll go back to 10. So for years I used 11s. Like if you tune down half step, it, it's the same, yeah. the same feel as 10, yeah. but, you know, but that's same with picking, you know, uh, when the string doesn't give, there's more uh, accuracy and consistent. Yeah, I mean, that's the same thing for, for a few years. I used 11 to 52s on my guitars. Yeah. And the feel for Legato is great. But again, like you say, just everything else. And also, of course, because I, um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not. I mean, I tune the guitar slightly differently. So yes. I have a C and an F. Yeah. So I've got even more tension on my, high, my highest two strings. And the 11s were great. But again, you just couldn't. If you wanted to bend a tone and a half, oh, well, if I wanted to bend a tone and a half, I've got weak little fingers and there was no way it was going to work. Because again, that's kind of a counterintuitive thing. Like, I have to ask my partner to open jars for me and stuff like that. You know, it's like, <laughs> I don't have really strong hands. If I hold like grocery um, stuff in a, in a kind of plastic bag, right. my fingers get really kind of um, worn out very, very quickly. Um, I don't really have long fingers or anything, but the consistency of the technique and kind of, um, you know, being relaxed helps a lot with it. So 11s were great, but then when I needed to do more aggressive, more physical kind of playing, it was just out the window completely. So yeah. now I think probably the same as you, I'm 10 to 46. Yeah, yeah. And that just seems to offer that compromise. For, yeah, the, for the balance, best vocals, yeah. Really. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. the idea anyway. Yeah, now you were talking about um, like uh, practicing the legato and some of the courses uh, you have. Now you have a lot of... Uh, uh, great courses out there and a lot of material available and um, the more you get into it it seems like you have a, a genuine desire to share your knowledge and to help other people like there's great players out there who may not have the skill or the desire to teach but you seem to have both can you talk a little bit about that and uh, like what yeah. are some of your more popular courses uh, that are available? yeah so I mean, I'm going to sort of give a, a, a kind of cheesy alert here. This is going to sound a little bit kind of like a cliche, but I think it's actually true. Um, you don't own any of the information that's imparted to you by other people. Right. And I think it's a, it's a bad place to be for you mentally if you start feeling like you own any of that. Um, because someone else has taken the time to teach and share you. You don't invent, very few people invent these things. Right. We learn music either as an oral tradition or as a, a kind of pedagogic, pedagogical, if I can even say it, tradition. So it's a taught tradition, you know, yeah. where you have met, method books and, you know, you're taught by um, people who can already do the craft. And so if you start going down the route of thinking, well, I'm not going to share anything I've kind of got now because I'm protecting it as my own. Right. I'm scared and worried about what other people might do. It's a much better feeling to share that information with other people because yeah. I enjoyed learning from my teachers and got a huge amount out of it. So I've always liked teaching. Unfortunately, I don't get to do so much of it in person these days, but I do get to do a lot of, um, you know, the Lick Library stuff and my right. courses. I have a video studio here, um, which I won't show you because it's a mess right now. But, um, you know, that side of things really is is one of the ways that you know you can connect with um and apart from gigging is one of the best ways you can connect with other musicians because teaching them things and seeing the look on their face when they finally get something they either understand it or they can do it or yeah you know that's that sound that's been giving them goosebumps and you know suddenly they understand what it is and they can recreate it themselves is just amazing you know it's yes. a really great thing and i i had that when i was learning as well um so i love putting those things together and, and get really excited and you know when I release them and people enjoy them and I get nice emails from people saying oh man that course was fantastic yeah I, I guess the ones that are the most popular are I guess because I'm known for the legato thing the legato three-part series right. is the one that is the most popular um and it's done I'm, I'm constantly surprised by sort of how if you like how well it's done and yeah. how many people have gone through that course and sent me nice emails telling me how useful it was. Um, right. I won't name them, but even some people, like some of my heroes have bought that course and oh, gone through awesome. it. And, you know, some some names that, I, again, I couldn't do it. I couldn't right. bring myself to name them, but some, like, truly, like, it's receiving an email from that person is just, like, how is this even real? You know, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. So so that's amazing as, as a kind of um, mental reward for putting that stuff together. And it just shows that, you know, there is a lot of reward in teaching. And, yeah. you know, if anybody out there is listening to this and they're not 
gigging for a living and they they, they feel, ah, oh, just teach. That's an amazing thing to do <laughs> as a musician. It's a really amazing thing to do, to pass on that knowledge and help yeah. people to become a better player. So, you know, um, I guess the other ones that are popular, the ones that delve into the jazz side of things, because I think one thing that's amazing now is obviously in the 80s, we went through the shred thing right. and it was an amazing time. And I wish I'd been younger and could have kind of lived through it and been part of it. Yeah. And then in the 90s, we had kind of the grunge thing and guitar took a bit of a, a dive in terms of the technical side of things. But now it's come back again. But it's come back where so many guitar players these days, young guys as well, have this incredible theoretical and harmonic knowledge as yeah. well. Yeah. So you see these young guys playing jazz standards and stuff, and it's like, okay, this is crazy. <laughs> so it's really nice to see that guitar players are getting interested again in the, in the theoretical side of music, Yeah. Um, not just shredding. As right. cool as that is, I'm the first guy to be blown away by amazing shredding. But, um, you know, the, t the, the, the theory side of things as well, it's so nice to see people getting interested in that. So all the stuff on melodic minor scales, um, yeah. jazz harmony, two five ones, all that kind of stuff does, you know, is very popular as well. So, but yeah, it's just great to be able to help people out with that stuff. And I've got a few more planned as well. Um, I don't get, as much time to put those things together anymore but right. hopefully i've got maybe maybe two coming out this year that i've oh, got okay, planned cool. so that's going to be good yeah great